all right, might want to strap in and get in a comfy chair and grab a bucket of popcorn or whatever you do. And uh, we're going to talk about the Hyksos. I was researching, pulling together a video about some new information on King Tut because they've made the new museum and in moving all the stuff over, like a third of this stuff's never been seen by the public at all. Half of that that is there has only been seen by a handful of people ever, and some of it hasn't been seen in 50, 60 years by anybody. What There's this one guy charted in that looked at this set of stuff and these boxes, and what the hell is this? And it's all the stuff that was caught out of There's almost 5,000 articles. Of course, a lot of them are shopty dolls and so on, and that leads to some, some of the things that are revealed in that. Uh, but we're going to, you know, I don't know, we'll touch upon that in this one. And depending on if I've got, oh, a little room at the end of part two, if I have to go into that, I don't, I don't know how this is going to go, but I think it'll go into like three even. And sometimes I have a part three that just goes for five or ten minutes like y'all have heard before so I can put it at the end of that but I would almost rather like to do it in its separate entity for what it is and because it has that lustrous King Tut thing but we're going to definitely touch on that too in the same thing this won't be so much a visual although I will go into visual little pictures they have on here and a couple of other things and when we touch upon people I'll show you things but uh so this Hyksos people that we know about, Hyksos or Hyksos, um, known as Egyptological pronunciation now is Hakakasut, and it means rulers of foreign lands. An ancient group, uh, Greek, like an Attic type Greek, it's Hyksos uh, Yus, and there was no J's back in there. So, hey, what is that? That, never mind. They were a people of diverse origins, they say, though. Possibly, though, just from Western Asia. When we talk about Western Asia, we're looking at something that's uh, pretty much ancient Sabaeans, Yemenites, Sabaeans, and uh, like the Queen of Sheba, and uh, Sumerians, and all the way over and edging into India, right? and Elamites and Zagros Mountains people but importantly too up right up in yeah I can't even do it with it on on the tag here but straight up top in the middle of it like if the thing looked like a little ghost in there like whoo his head's kinda cut off but not really and that's the Caucasus Mountains that are there and of course his left arm in the picture would be Anatolia or Asia Minor and this really is a portion of what you would call Western Asia, you know, if you will. But they settled in the Eastern Nile Delta sometime before 1650 BC. So they had already been there and then they're going to change that in a minute too and I'm going to go before that too, but let's just stay with this. The arrival of the Hyksos led to the end of the 13th dynasty and initiated the second intermediate period of Egypt. So when they had come into there, people believe it was a great um, famine and stuff and then they had went into there and uh, they always try to connect the Bible with like, oh, it's gotta be this one, gotta be that one and everything. And I'll make some connections for you, see if I can do it a little bit touchy and then I'll probably just say it straightforward here in a minute and to try to get into it so I can have you on page with me whenever I make other comments. In the context of ancient Egypt the term Asiatic refers to people native to areas east of Egypt they say but that's why I wanted to show you that Western Asia and Asiatics isn't necessarily somebody that's east of, but they talked about the Sabaeans and the people over there, and they were the vile Asiatics, said they were the desert dwellers and stuff, and the other part wasn't so much at that time, and it would have been around the corner in the south, where they try to say the biblical people went down and around and through and came back out to tie, to, tie together these people, but 
in that concept, whenever it says in the Bible they went across the Red Sea, it's really the Reed Sea, and it's just that little glitch that's right there leading into the Canaanite lands, if you will. And uh, everybody says, oh, there's Canaanites and Phoenicians, and really the Phoenicians, uh, Phoenicians called themselves Canaan. And so that pretty much covers that. And they were all the way around the Mediterranean, which means Middle Earth, by the way. And uh, so let's just get into this before I go way off in left field, one paragraph in and waste 30 minutes like I can do. Immigration by Canaanite. And if you look at their picture here, ooh, let's see if I can, uh, what, go way down there and then pull it up. And, uh, oh, it's going to do that to me, huh? How about if I do it about this height? No, no, you suck, huh? Let's, let's try to go, whoa. It wanted to reset. So, now where's my picture? Now it's where they were there. So the Canaanite lands that are there, and it's pretty much everything that you're seeing here. Now it's cutting off at Anatolia, but you can see Anatolia and the Greek islands that are over there, right over here. And the edge of what's drawn is Spain, which is way too damn close. It looks like Spain's boot and everything in the island, the top of it. But around the corner, and you can see how this is just, I know it's real small, but this is just clustered up with little bitty names. And then there's this little gap that goes here. And this area that's in here is known as the Sea of Reeds. And they grow all the papyrus out of there. And these people use some of it. And these people use some of it, of course. And a lot of Egyptians use it. And it's a mainstay of it. You wouldn't believe how much things were a mainstay that were in the Delta, not so much in the other places, and we'll get into that in a minute if I can just get to it. But, so immigration by Canaanite populations precede the Hyksos. Canaanites first appeared in Egypt at the end of the 12th dynasty, or 1800 BC, or, or maybe 1720. So, just a minute ago, they were saying 1650, but now they got 1750, 1800 going on to it. And they were familiar with each other from 3,999 BC, way back in the Nakata period and so on. And there were a people of lower and upper Egypt that eventually got together, 3,100 BC or so, ish, ish. And there is some ish, ish in this and things float around because some dynasties overlap each other whenever they were intermediate periods and they put them back to backs and all kinds of things there'll be a reference to that that's in here also and it, it throws things off just a little bit and that helps it to be hidden in the truth of things but we'll try to get into all of that too but um so 18 1700 bc but they were well aware of each other and it wasn't like um at that last river on the right of the delta, there were only Egyptians, and then there's this big gap, and nobody lives there, and then there starts to be some Phoenician-type Palestinian area people leading into Judah and all that stuff, What you'd know about that. A third of the way up is Jerusalem, which is Jerusalem now, and then leading on to Sidon and other areas and Baalbek and so on like that, all encapsulated within within here. So, at that time, they say at 1800 BC, they established an independent realm in the eastern Nile Delta, so the first few rivers over there. The Canaanite rulers of the Delta regrouped and founded the 14th dynasty. Bingo! which coexisted with the Egyptian 13th dynasty. They show you right there that, what? Well, let, let's just get into it. And it was based in Ijitawi. Now, Ijitawi, I was going to do one actually on this and lead it down, but it's going to do that to me again. Let's try this. Piece of crap. Let's go down deep and then put it up. Really? How about if I go so far that you have to put it above me? There it is. Ijitawi is yet an identified location of the royal city founded by the 12th dynasty Egyptian king and in Hemat 
the first who ruled from about 1991 BC to 1962 BC during the year 20 of his reign they started this city it's located in the Fayum region they don't know where it is but its cemeteries are located at Lisht El Ashun and Deshur and uh, there's a lot of people that were saying that he, maybe he built it on the uh, west side of the Nile and by the way the Nile in quite a few areas has moved quite a bit I, it used to be a lot closer to the pyramids and it's pivoted over and down in Cairo but then through some of these other areas it's pivoted over as much as like two kilometers and so on and they talk about how well they, they took most of probably the stonework and crap and went off with it but because it got eaten into slowly a couple of floods and stuff and it's gone after it ate into the city you know there wasn't a dam type situation it just got to a certain point it was a natural situation there was no dam controlling it back in the day. They tried to make one, and it uh, got destroyed, and that probably caused a big problem in that year, too. But that's for another video. Anyhow, so near Deshur and stuff like that. Um, the power of the 13th and 14th dynasty progressively waned, perhaps due to famine and plague. And... This is that idea that's in your Bible, so get that idea that's going on of the famine and the plague and the idea of Joseph coming in and telling him, why don't you save your grain when it's good and it'll last longer through the other, but uh, let's just go. In about 1650, the Hyksos invaded the territory of both dynasties and established the 15th dynasty. The collapse of the 13th dynasty caused a power vacuum in the south which may have led to the rise of the 16th dynasty based in Thebes. So this in turn is seemingly going on at the same point too. And so there's been the 13th and 14th going on, but then the 15th that comes after that is going on simultaneous with the rise of the 16th dynasty overlapping in Thebes. And Thebes is, see if they'll show it. That, well, it's also, it was known as Waset, but it's uh, about 800 kilometers or 500 miles to the south of the Mediterranean. Its ruins lie between modern city of Luxor, so that's where you probably know it as and everything. It was an upper Egyptian gnome. Gnomes were like city-state areas. Anyhow, and possibly of a local Abydos dynasty. An Abydos dynasty is a weird one where it's uh, hypothesized a short-lived dynasty ruling over the middle parts and upper Egypt during the second intermediate period in ancient Egypt. Abydos dynasty would have been contemporaneous with the 15th and 16th dynasty. So this is going on too, right? And uh, there are lists which just kind of leave out some people and stuff and we know about that and they're trying to mark certain people out of history and boy if they can just take a and chip off their nose and bust their face off you see them take just their face off or their whole body in some places and everything and and they think they do that because the magic that's on the wall is gonna not be in effect like even though it's already boom boom and so the next day you would it would have been coming forth by day does it continue to do this and if we stop or if I do this thing does it ruin the magic and everything just a break here for a moment um, you know that's the reason I got into Egypt uh, if you've been following me that's because I, I got into Dungeons and Dragons well I got into old stuff but not deep as much as you could as a kid who read some stuff and um, old Collier's encyclopedias and wonders of the world and stuff like that that my dad had that he basically when I got into stuff he was like you know I had a library type thing and he's like here and here and I've got a few of those an armory one and a bunch of other stuff in mine and hell I've got a stack of them built up in with mine and once he passed away I basically got all of his set um, but I got into Dungeons and Dragons and I wanted to make something, a uh, story out of Egypt because I had come up with crap whenever I was playing D&D that sounded kind of like it and I got a little idea, you know, kind of like a module or whatever you would run through. 
and I had an idea, of course, after watching, you know, Conan the Barbarian and stuff about going through Sumeria type stuff. That's where I akin it to, and you know, ancient Greece and Romans even, but that was getting more more modern. That almost comes out of a D and D world. You want to get back into an ancient, you know, Western European type elfin land, things that happen like that, the land of Odin and stuff like that seems to fit it a whole lot more. Norse's situations, Vikings and everything. Because there's always a cold element in the mountains and all that stuff. But, you know, there's mountains all the way down into Ethiopia itself, right near the equator, that get snow on the top of them. And the Atlas Mountains get snow on them, and that's off the Mediterranean there. So you, you, you can be right there off the Mediterranean and, uh, you know, across from the Pillars of Hercules and turn around and look at white-topped mountains. It's a little out of view if it's not super clear unless you're a lot closer, though, but the Atlas Mountains are right in behind that. And that's, you know, goes through a bunch of old stories and everything. So uh, whenever I got into playing D&D more and more and was given a chance to run a campaign and do a thing I did one and everybody liked it and they were like okay well next week da 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 and I was like what the hell am I going to do and uh, well I've got these things and this one will go with what they did so I'll go this one first and then I'll run it through Greeks and then we'll do this Sumerian one and then we'll, well how am I going to get these to fit though because their gods aren't the same so I started to get into it a little more, and I found that where I could at least put a couple of their major gods to the same, and went off of that. And uh, we didn't even get to do this next week. I had a separate adventure that was able to be done as like a, you know, you wake up in a, you know, it was it all a dream is what it was. It was one of those things whenever we got through the thing, it was like, was it all a dream? And I go, no, it wasn't a dream. You got experience points and here's this and here's that and you still have some of these things so you know that it actually all happened next week I'll have this thing for you you know and stuff and it took a couple of weeks before we even got back together and uh, whenever we did somebody ran another campaign thing and then a couple of weeks even after that I ended up getting able to start run this and everything but uh, by then you know it was so oh, six weeks worth of going into it and I'm like okay Saturn is this and that's the El, and that's the god of the Canaanites. And so, okay, and so there's Baal, and there's Storm God, and that's Hadad, and that's this, and that's that, and okay. And then uh, I'd already seen it, kind of, but, and it's weird, the music I was listening to seemed to be telling you about it, but funky crap, you know, uh, uh, growing up in the 70s, 60s, 70s, and 80s and stuff, and you had music that was based around that. And we got into heavy metal. They had album covers like Journey and stuff that had the wing scarab and all these things on it while I was studying all these things. And it was just like it's in your face and you don't know it. And it's been ever since. And the symbology keeps going on and it keeps getting held on to. But the reason I liked Egypt so much is because they had this ancient thing like the elves and the Tuatha Danan and the knowing of what were basically the Neanderthals versus Cro-Magnon people and who are the fairy and fair people and what was going on through there and if there are fair people who are the brownies that are mischievous and shit well it ends up being the farming people they'd have more of a tan or rednecks type you know versus the these very fair people and of course much more blonde hair and you find out well they were there before the proto-indo-europeans came anyhow i'm getting in way way off in left field now and i just wanted to say something and i haven't even really got to it yet but what i liked about egypt is that they have this animism and there's a little bit in sumeria but it seems like they're letting it go but it still goes on in egypt and there's that same hawk god, and there's Shimsu Hor and stuff I found out much later going through it and had to pick it out of people that didn't want to agree that it said it right here. 
but and that ends up being these time before time that they say you know later in this that they have this um, Manetho and they've got different ones of the lineages there and they go this one's probably closest to what it is in reality there's another one that's written on the walls and the temple at, where is it is it Abydos and it goes back to all of the very first one and Menes and stuff and it keeps going and it keeps going and it keeps going and it's one oh, now I'm forgetting but it, there's a man I forget which one it was and I don't want to misquote it and have somebody go crazy so say it down in the things anyhow but he's showing his son and then it starts and they go well if it starts it starts up here so boom 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 well where's Menes at and it's like way down there and then it talks about this before that there was 10,000 years of the Shimsu horror and everything what are you talking about and it's people have tried to say that it's just them trying to give tenure and long life like in the Bible and they see these people lived hundreds of years and they had a kid and now it's 400 years has a kid and his kids do this stuff and everything so anyhow I'm going to get off in the left field. We're at already 20 minutes here, and I haven't gotten a third through this. So Let's see if we can't get back on track. The animism, what I was talking about, is like when people were more into tune with nature. And coming out of that was using nature and plants in certain ways, and they had a time of magic. Because you look at Egypt and they have these magic scrolls and this certain crap you're supposed to do and all kinds of weird stuff. And I started getting those as neat little ideas to do for people in D&D. &D. And I would take and make a fake scroll, like I would make a map and it would be out of that chart paper, little graph cube paper. And I would take a lighter and burn it around the edge after I've done the whole thing. I would take and burn it around the edge. And then I would roll it up and then unroll it and roll it up and unroll it and roll it up and unroll it and then I would take it and flip it upside and I'd put it in a pan that I'd put tea into and just let it dry out and it would look like it had just colored and, and crappy or whatever and then I'd take and roll it up and not roll it up and I'd roll it up again burn some wax off a red candle my mom had from Christmas and then stick this thing that I had that was like a seal it made an imprint that looked kind of like one of the seals and stuff and then would give that and I, you know that's something cool you can do during D and go, go and boom and I had some books by then too that I could take and like Frazetta pictures and stuff and Brother Silderbrand and so on that you could pull out and you could go and it the unicorn looks like this or you would have something that almost looked like your scene and you'd go it looks like this but instead of being an ogre it's an orc but it's this is the scene you know so picture that and everybody get a good idea so we'd be on the same page because in doing this it's all in your mind and uh, no matter what happens there's a different picture somebody's gonna go there were there were a lot of trees and he goes no there weren't any trees we were all out in the open and stuff or things like that so yeah every once in a while you have to pull it back in a little bit and still in the same same breath you end up with a different statement goes on but this animism that I keep straying away from and you can see it in the animals and they're pulling them in with the idea of the uh, gods and they're taking animal aspects and pulling it in right that that's one of the last vestiges of it and it's amazing that those people were able to get so much technology going on at a time they still had that going on because it's edging out of shamanism and that would be a much more primitive thing. You look at the people that are up in Gobekli Tepe and stuff, and it looks like that's what was going on, but that's 10,000 B.C. And we find now they come down and become the Natufians, and the Natufians look like they turned into the people of Nakata and the Badarians and stuff that is pre-dynastic Egypt. There you go. but it's still there hanging 
and they already had astrology and everything going on but other people it loses real quick and with the Greeks they use a bunch of animal aspects in things like he turns into a white cow and he turns into an eagle and he does this and he does that and that's about as close as you get really there's a few other cases in the Minotaur and all these situations right but it's pulled out of that a little bit but Egypt still had that thicker and you almost look at it as being well Egypt was going strong and at the end of it going strong but was still going Greeks came on strong and they have a another level of architecture and especially their sculpture and people in movement and how real it looks and uh, how that has to do with this myth that came out this Medusa that would stare at somebody and they would turn to stone because there they are and she would have a large amount of people sculpted for herself and in her gallery and it literally looked and these people were painted up and have certain clothing on them and things like that back in the day these weren't all done white although hers may have been and it may have had that effect where she turned into stone but a lot of Greek ones they found out now and stuff they have with along with the Egyptians and I was going to do one with it on there but the Egyptians a lot of these old plaster things they have and everything they have blue eyes but you can't see it but you can take a blue light, an actinic blue light, that funny blue light, not like a black light, but it's that weird blue, like in saltwater reef aquariums, and throw it over it and it just glows. And there's something about that in these Shabdi dolls that are blue and have this gold, and this golden yellowy green. It ends up being that weird day glow color that if you flashed across it, that blue would be one of the only blues that'll show up in a black light situation and then the yellow that's on there is like that zzzzt day glow looking yellow and what's funny is even though it's green it shows up as yellow and the yellow yellow shows up as yellowy green like a chartreuse kind of color if you will um, I've gotten dyes to make spider webs giant handmade fishnet but shaped like a spider web the way they're supposed to look out for the Halloween displays we used to do a lot when the kids were growing up and uh, I soaked them in this dye and everything and put black lights on them from reef tanks that are so bright they grow the corals but faced out at them away from the kids and it just made everything glow and stuff it's pretty cool but man I've gone in left field quite a bit and I wasted six or seven minutes there and I'm sorry guys I'd probably just like to cut that out maybe I'll just let it go anyhow so, this animism effect, though, was something that, that made me want to look into them further, but then other cultures and see what was going on at the same time. And, well, there's very little known about these people. And it's like at Greece, they, you know, at Greece it just ends, and there's nothing to the west of them. And you go all the way to the coast, and then there's Oriental people in China. But if you go north, it's Eskimos. What? It's just all wide open. Well, that's that's as big as. There's no way there. Oh, there's the Scythians. And you start finding out different stories about these Scythians. You go, well, there's a lot going on. Okay. What did they have going on? And they had dragon symbology and all this other stuff. And I go, well, yeah, well, that came out. Oh, hold on a minute. So I started looking at that, and sure enough, here comes that dragon. And, oh man, I've got a whole video that I want to do a presentation on doing that. So we're going to go back to this right here. But this is a point of a meeting of some of those people with some of those same people from elder, elder times. And eventually, we'll just say it this way so I can get back into it. Eventually, the same people grew so big that they came around and like two snakes coming together, they bit their own tail. Like in Conan. Like in the symbology of the Amphalos and the Rap Serpent. Let's continue. So the Hyksos eventually conquered both of Central, which was running Egypt, but it, even though they conquered Central, 
then whenever they faltered back down to they still ran the first part of it they were like don't fuck with me and there was still uh, Upper Egypt totally separate from them and there's even somebody going to talk about it here that shows you that they felt secure in it at the point that they actually rebelled back against the Hyksos and kicked him out which is the exodus of the Bible then we just get into this more Hyksos they conquered both from then on the 17th dynasty took control of Thebes and reigned for some time in peaceful coexistence with the Hyksos kings perhaps as their vassals and but no it actually goes the other way and you'll see it in some of the speech that's used in a minute eventually Sener uh, Sequinare Tau and Kamos and Amos eventually waged war against the Hyksos and expelled Kamudi which was the last king of the dynasty and then they got kicked out his capital is Avaris what makes this important is so there was Raiders of the Lost Ark and here it's in your face again when I was a kid the different things and the music and stuff and so that's where Indiana Jones goes looking and finding the lost Ark of the Covenant because if you'll remember he finds a special medallion that burns that one guy's hand on a staff but they don't have the whole staff because it's a sectionated staff and he has the piece at the bottom and the middle and the top he puts them together and puts it in on a certain day of the year and the sun coming through a certain point running through that crystal puts a light which it goes but it just puts a light on a certain spot and he knows okay it's in there and then he went outside and he basically like that's got to be that hump of sand there which you wouldn't believe what's probably still up under humps of sand in Egypt but he went down into there, remember the snakes, the whole eye, nine, nine yards, and he finds it. People melt their face off in the idea that goes along with that. That was a Varus. Sequinari Tau is, his mummy shows it's got axe wounds into its head, and he's just, he's screwed up. And uh, apparently he got killed in the very first of it, but Kamos and Amos finished it off to it, right? And now it's about 1550 BC. There appears to be a little bit of a discrepancy in there too with the time of when the Minoan Crete and the Isle of Santorini exploded. <coughs> Pardon me. And the Isle of Santorini exploded, but it appears to go along with this same time. And if you figure that into the idea of they went across the Reed Sea and then it flooded in or whatever happened off that you could make something up that they made it just across like we but that would have washed into those whole areas and what's odd is they don't have accurate record of it probably because they were recording records at this time in fact there's just gaps here and okay well this was the gap and there are some mentions of it but you know, Egypt had so much pride, they didn't talk about it whenever they lost or damn near lost or went through a famine much. But there are even some depictions on the wall when they went through famines, they show it on the wall and they say people are starving to death. And they show it. And you think about that happening in Egypt when Egypt seemed to be the helper that helped every, everybody out that was attached to them because their season ran a little different than everybody. And even if you got screwed over, we got you covered. But whenever they get screwed over by a flood and everything, then they have a hard time getting covered. And it caused a big problem. And have a big flood, it would take out your crop for a year pretty much, and you'd have very little to none. And have to wait till next year to try to do it. And next year runs through a drought situation for some stupid reason. And they say seven years and all this crap, but all it would take is like that back to back. And you'd start to go through, oh my, you know, it would get out of hand because you would have probably gone through your resources pretty well. Well, 
the story of the ant and the grasshopper and save up your stuff whenever good times are coming and everything, but you save up a bunch of grain and keep stockpiling on it and it goes bad. And that can cause ergot and things like LSD to happen, which are, is another story which had to do with witchcraft and all those things too that I found out during all those little studies back whenever I was studying for D&D. &D. So I would try to find all these stories and these magic spells that go along and it was like well, there's magic spells all over the wall well it just says this and it says that that's a magic spell he's calling in existence these things written in stone for all time over this area then they supposedly somebody reads it while they do this sage thing and blah 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 and somebody says that everything that's on there and goes through the story of it and walks out the door and they shut it and that's it. And they never really talk about that. But they do this opening of the mouth ceremony during the last of it and stuff. And that's in the Book of the Dead. But the Book of the Dead is only like the other stuff that goes along with it. But then there's these other little scrolls that they have found that go along with all these different things they do. And it goes from just somebody having a sty in their eye to you know whatever and uh their uses of aspirin and things and i've gone into 